as we've been looking at some of the post-resurrection narratives in the Scripture and how Jesus was speaking into people's lives, this morning, <clears throat> I think he has a word for all of us when we feel somewhat discouraged. And there are lots of people who are really struggling with life on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, some people find life can be va very much overwhelming, and they're not really sure how they are going to actually cope. And so we even have expressions that people will say. Some people say, and if you know the answer, you can shout it out, I give up. Or, I'm at the end of my, or I'm going to throw in the. So those are all words implying, I just can't continue with what I'm actually doing. Uh, life, to me, seems to be almost impossible. A number of years ago, there was a very famous British parliamentarian whose name was William Wilberforce. I'm sure if you've ever studied history, you know that his name is prominent in British history. Because Wilberforce, more than anything else, is remembered for his push to actually abolish slavery. It was not an easy thing for him to do, and he became extremely discouraged, and he was virtually at the point of giving up. To his great surprise, he received a letter one day from John Wesley. And as you know, Wesley is the founder of the Methodist Church. Wesley uh, preached all over Great Britain, traveling hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles on the back of a horse, proclaiming the good news of God's love. And John Wesley knew that Wilberforce had been trying to abolish slavery and was becoming very discouraged, so he sent him a note. And let me read to you part of the note. He said this, Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of other people. But if God is for you, who can be against you? Are all of those stronger than God? And then these words, don't be weary in well-doing. Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might. Wilberforce got that letter from John Wesley, and it's interesting, six days later, John Wesley died. But those words in that letter encouraged him to such an extent that he continued on with his fight for the abolition of slavery for the next 45 years. And finally, in the year 1833, just three days before his own death, slavery was abolished in Great Britain. It was the encouragement of John Wesley and those words that he spoke that enabled Wilberforce to continue for 45 more years. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? how those words can keep you going. In the face of our discouragements, and I don't know what yours will be this morning or what you are facing in your own life, but I do know that we all need someone who will come alongside us to help us to learn to pick up the pieces and to be able to continue forward. Jesus did not promise to us that when you become a Christian, it's going to be a bed of roses. He did not say that life is suddenly going to become easy and everything will go well. We have just heard in this past week that after almost 65 years of hostility between the north and the south of Korea, there is the possibility of a unification. The leaders are getting together. They're wanting to put down their nuclear proliferation. And I know that the Korean church in South Korea is one of the strongest components of the Christian faith in the world today. And per capita, more missionaries around the world come from South Korea than from any other nation in the world. They have continued on in spite of all the challenges and discouragements of life. And so Jesus warned us. He said, in this world you will have opposition. Things will not necessarily go easy for you. But then he said this, but be of good cheer. There's hope. 
because I have overcome the world. So when I think about encouragement, it really is about trying to inspire others, to try to cheer them on, to spur them on, and not to be stuck where they are in a slough of despair. The word encouragement has the word cour, which is the French word for heart, right at the center. And when we encourage somebody, it means we're putting our heart into it. I'm putting my energies into what I am going to be doing. Sometimes we say, do you love me with all your heart? Do you work with all of your heart and soul? It's very easy to discourage people. It's very easy to become disheartened. I'm thinking about Thomas Edison, who supposedly invented the light bulb, although it is questionable. But he had a, a myriad of ways that he was trying, and he reached about 999, and it failed again. And so what did he say? He said, well, I've discovered 999 ways that it doesn't work. And so what is going to be the next one? And eventually he discovered it. In the early church, from the lesson we read this morning from the book of Acts, we need to understand that life was difficult for the early Christians. And they began to meet together. Sometimes they met in small groups in homes. Later, when the persecution would become great, they met in catacombs or in cemeteries, places where the authorities would not find them. And for many of them, persecution was almost a way of life. Some were not allowed to work at prestigious jobs. Some were not permitted to own businesses. And in the early church, the majority of people came from the very low economic strata of that society simply because they were followers of Jesus and the culture would not give them any leg up. Fear gripped the lives of some of these people. Some of them were really defeated and discouraged. Others said, let's just play it safe and not rock the boat. And so a letter began to circulate. We don't really know who the author was, although many would attribute it to the Apostle Paul. But this letter was given to encourage people who were experiencing persecution, and it's simply called the Letter to the Hebrews. In this book, you read many short exhortations or words of encouragement that are spoken to people. Here are just simply three from the reading this morning. The first one was, hold on to the hope you profess. Don't let go. Hang on to the truth that you know and the hope that is yours in spite of what's happening to you. Another word of encouragement was, Find ways to stimulate others to love and to good works. And a third one was, find ways to encourage each other. Because the author knew that people were going through a very difficult period of time. Now, when was this to happen? Hold on to the hope you profess. Stimulate others to love and good works encourage each other with what is going on in life. Well, part of that was to take place when they actually worshiped together, when they came together as a community of faith. Now, many of them would not be in a gathering this large. They might be in gatherings of 10, 15, almost like some of the small groups that exist in this community of faith. But you see, worship is more than just singing songs. It is more than just offering prayers. It is more than just reading the scriptures and teaching the truth of scripture. Part of our worship is to be an experience where we actually encourage each other. So I'm going to give you a heads up. I'm going to give you a challenge at the end of this morning to find a way to encourage some people right here this morning. So you can be thinking about it. Some of you are already in a sweat. What am I going to do? You're not going to be put on the spot, but we want you to be able to do more than just, oh, I heard about that. Now I'm going to find out ways that I can actually begin to do this. So to help us to understand this a bit more, 
There's a story in the book of Acts about a very quiet, unassuming man. Many people hardly know anything about him. He was a stranger to many. His name was Joseph. He was somewhat of a respected leader in the church, and he originally came from the island of Cyprus. But they decided to give him a new name. Do any of you here have a nickname? Probably you don't want to admit what it is, but growing up as a kid, you might have been called a nickname by someone. Well, was very often in the church, they gave people names. And so they called this guy, not Joseph, they called him Barnabas, or Barney, maybe if it was a short, shortened version, because the name fit his character. And Barnabas simply means son of encouragement. And every time you see Barnabas in Scripture, that's what he's doing. He's actually encouraging other people. And there are four texts in the Scriptures where he is actually mentioned in the book of Acts. He's a remarkable man, though he is quiet and unassuming. He has an amazing ministry that he engages in. And so we're going to look at three little pictures or vignettes of this man. The first one we find in Acts chapter 4, and here it is. Joseph, called Barnabas, sold a field he owned, brought the money, and gave it to the apostles. Now the Christians at this point in the story were living in the city of Jerusalem. They were persecuted. They were financially strapped. That's where the term, the proverbial poor as a church mouse started. No, I didn't. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> but you get the picture. They were as poor as church mice. A lot of people had all kinds of practical needs, and some of them were absolutely desperate. So what does the church do? They begin to pool their resources. It's kind of like what Ryan said in the children's story. There were atoms that were rich and atoms which are somewhat depleted. When they came together the rich atoms were able to give to the depleted atoms the resources they needed. And that's exactly what happened in the early church. And we are told this truth. There was not a single person in the church in Jerusalem that had any need whatsoever because people shared life together. And so what does Barnabas do? He realizes that he has uh, been blessed by God he has more than what he actually needs. And so he has a piece of property, and he sells it. And in his quiet, unassuming way, comes to the leadership of the church and says, here's some extra money. You distribute it as it is needed. He didn't want his name and recognition to be spread about. He was giving this as unto God. And so he does it in a very quiet and unassuming manner. And so as we read the opening part of the book of Acts, we are told there was not a single needy person in their midst. What an incredible act of encouragement. Do you see how practical it is? How simple it is? Here is someone in need, and I can find a way to help that person. That becomes a great encouragement for the person who has that need that is actually being met. The second vignette happens a little later in the book of Acts, chapter 9. And what happened is this. There was a man called Saul of Tarsus, and he was out persecuting the Christians. He had rounded up many of them, and they were thrown into prison. He had consented to the death of Stephen, the very first Christian martyr. But then along the Damascus Road, God got a hold of his life, and he was transformed. He is now a devoted follower of Jesus. So he comes to Jerusalem, and he tries to join up with the other disciples that were there. Now, they don't know about him very much. They know of his reputation, and they are frightened. They are afraid to have this man join them because they do not believe the sincerity of his conversion. Have you ever heard of a, an expression called jailhouse conversions? 
You know, people suddenly are going to get right with God because maybe it will help them in front of their parole officer, and it might just be a religious sham. On the other hand, it could be genuine. But you don't really know. And that's exactly what the disciples were like in Jerusalem. They're not sure if he is truly a follower of Jesus or he's just finding a way to worm his way into their midst so that he can haul more of them off to prison. So what happens? Barnabas comes along. And he vouches for this Saul of Tarsus. The validity of his conversion he convinces them of. And he says, we have actually heard him. And he is preaching and teaching. And all of this is true. And the disciples accept him. The church now continues to grow in spite of all the hardships that they are facing, the persecutions and the difficulties that they encounter. And so Barnabas goes to this city called Antioch. And Antioch is the very first city where the term Christian was ever used, which means literally Christ followers. But he goes there for a purpose, and his purpose is this. He wants to encourage these Christians in the city of Antioch to be true and faithful to God. Now, it's not just enough to give people a pep talk and say, you need to be true and you need to be faithful. He knew that they needed to be taught. They need to be grounded in their faith so that they can grow up in their relationship with God. But Barnabas knows that he can't do it on his own. He needs help. So who does he send for? He sends for this guy, Saul of Tarsus, the one he had vouched for in the city of Jerusalem. You see, Barnabas recognized the potential in Saul's life. Saul was schooled in the Old Testament. He was a brilliant orator. He was an intellectual giant. And he could be of such great value in helping these young Christians to grow in their faith. But Barnabas does not have a hint of jealousy. He knows that Saul is a far more gifted teacher than he is. And even though Saul is a younger man than he is, he recognizes his gifting and his leadership role, and he commits him to the church. Now, it's interesting as you read the book of Acts. In the opening part of this relationship between Barnabas and Saul, it goes like this. And Barnabas and Saul went and did thus and so. But later on, as Paul's giftedness is recognized, the order is reversed. It is now Saul and Barnabas. Saul is recognized as the true leader. I've never been asked to play in a symphony orchestra, and I never will be. But I kind of think the most difficult chair to have would be second chair. Most people would love to be first chair of the symphony, not for Barnabas. He was so excited to see God's gifting of this leader that he put him in the most prominent place in the life of the church. Do you see how Barnabas was such an encourager to this Saul of Tarsus? When he could have been written off, he welcomed him into the community of faith. He vouched for him. He recognized his giftedness and his leadership. And he put him in a place of prominence. Paul was not looking for that. But he was greatly encouraged. And so, what does he say to the people? When you go there, he encouraged people to be true to the Lord with all their heart. The last vignette happens in Acts chapter 15. A group of people, and this happens over and over again in the early church, get a little sidetracked. And they start to teach things that are actually false. The thing that they started to teach was this. Unless you follow certain religious rituals, you cannot become a follower of Jesus. These were Jewish people who had converted, and they said, you must go through the Jewish ritual of circumcision, which was the sign of the covenant, 
and then you can become a follower of Jesus. This was leaving out all the Gentiles, the non-Jewish folks. And so Paul, his name is now changed to Paul from Saul, joins with Barnabas, and they meet with these people who are teaching that it is by a, an act of works that you are actually brought into a relationship with God, and they dispute that teaching. But it wasn't enough. So they go to the city of Jerusalem, and they confer with the other disciples and apostles and elders who were there. The issue is resolved that we are justified before God through our faith in Jesus and in Him alone. There is nothing that we can do to earn this relationship with God. So they go back and they teach this to the people. But after a period of time, you wonder, has the teaching actually stuck? Or was it just something that passed through the airwaves? So Paul and Barnabas decide to go back and to explore how these young Christians are doing in the face of false teaching. And Barnabas says to Paul, why don't we take this young man whose name is John Mark, and he can come with us. Now, John Mark was a very young man, maybe 20, 21 years of age. Paul said, I don't want that kid along. I am not impressed with him at all because I took him with me on my very first missionary journey, and he quit. He quit. He deserted us. He can't hang in when the going gets tough. Barnabas said, Paul, I don't quite agree with you. I really want John Mark to come with me. He said, I'll tell you what. I'll take John Mark with me. And Paul said, okay, I'm going to take Silas with me. And if you read just beyond that a little bit, you discover that when Paul and Silas went, they got put into prison. That's when the walls all fell down. John, Mark, and Barnabas have an amazing ministry together. And it paid off. It paid off. When Paul's letter, or, uh, sorry, later, Paul is writing to Timothy, in the second letter, in the fourth chapter, he makes this little phrase in verse 11. And he says, I'm here all by myself except for Luke. And when you come again, could you bring John Mark with you? He has become a great help to me. See, Paul was willing to write him off. Barnabas wanted to encourage this young man and to give him a second chance. And it paid off. And John Mark became a significant leader as they continued the work of God. So this morning, as we look at life. The question I would ask you is this. Who do you know that needs encouragement? There are some people who have their back against the wall. There might be some people who are struggling to find acceptance by other people or even into a community of faith. Some people could be really discouraged because of what has been going on in their life and they wonder is there really any hope? Other people might think, you know, I've just been a failure. It could be like John Mark. You know, I quit. Who is going to be there to encourage me? And some people are just beaten down and worn out by all the challenges of life. What we need is someone to walk alongside of us. You know, the disciples of Jesus were really discouraged. They had heard that Jesus said, I'm going to leave you, and he was anticipating his return to heaven. And they thought, what's going to happen to us? But he goes on to say, but I'm going to send you another comforter, another helper, who will be with you forever. You know, in our English language, we use words that often have a different meaning than in the scriptural text. 
So when Jesus said, I'm going to send you another comforter, the word another is quite different. So I'm going to demonstrate it to you. Do you see this? This is one page, and this is another. The word means they're identical. But this is one page, and this is another page. But they're not identical. When Jesus said, I am going to send you the comforter, the helper, the Holy Spirit, he was using this word. We have the Spirit of Jesus with us. When we have given our hearts and lives to him, the Spirit of God comes and lives within us, and he will be with us forever. And so, as we follow Jesus, his Spirit lives within us to comfort us and to encourage us along the way. But he doesn't call us to live in isolation. He calls us to live in community. And here we are together this morning. How can I be an encourager in your life? How can I bring comfort into your experience? How do I allow the Spirit of Christ to live through me? If you want to follow Jesus, you can't be like the tin man in the Wizard of Oz. This is what the tin man said. I'd be tender, I'd be gentle, and awful sentimental if I only had a heart. We have the heart of Jesus. And he calls us to be encouragers to one another. Barnabas' heart was open to God. And the reality of that open heart was revealed by the way he encountered other people. We might say we love God, but how do we express that love for God? It's always expressed in the way we relate to others. As you look at Scripture, that is revealed over and over again. And so this morning, how can you be an encourager? A lot of people find life pretty tough. Possibly, you could write a note to someone who's going through a hard time and just do a John Wesley. That note held Wilberforce in place for 45 years. Or perhaps there could be people that you know need a second chance and you want to write them off like Paul did. And Barnabas said, let me walk with this person. Let me encourage them. Let me help them to grow and to develop. Or maybe you have the opportunity to speak into someone's life to verify who they are and what they are. So this morning... My challenge to each one of us is that as we go from here, that we'll say, Lord, I know you're going to bring people into my life this week. They're going to come. Some of them you might encounter even this morning here over coffee or wherever it's going to be as they exit the, uh, the sanctuary. Is there someone that God's impressing in your heart to bring a word of encouragement into their life? Wouldn't that be amazing? Or it could be an act where you actually do something that's going to help some person along the way. There's no set formula. Let God open your mind and your heart to the opportunities that are coming your way. Because as you do that, you are revealing the love of Jesus as he encourages us day by day. Let's pray together.